Thank you very much, Professor Nicolioni. I think everyone would agree that this was a very fascinating you know, talk. And uh, the kind of views you have given is something which, which, which is completely different from the general understanding that this is perhaps the last stages of uh, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu's political career, even though he has been able to survive uh, you know, so far. You have very clearly indicated that the ex speculations of the coming end of Netanyahu's political career is, is at least for now, is more speculation than reality. Uh, and you have given some you know, very good points for everyone to ponder upon. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we request, I mean, I request everyone to write their questions in the chat box. Uh, I already have one questions and I thought uh, with that, I will also start uh, from one of my questions. Uh, one of the things which, which, very, which is very often, you know, uh, uh, speculated and very often, uh, you know, cited in the, in the discussion in media and otherwise also in the academia also, is, is the, the, there is no alternative actually to Netanyahu and that factor. How far do you think that is important as far as, you know, uh, the continuity in terms of, uh, uh, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu is concerned. Uh, and then uh, uh, my friend uh, Alvait, who is a very keen observer of Israeli politics, he has asked a very interesting question actually as to, uh, as, as you have mentioned that, you know, there, there are ongoing protests and there has been some uh, kind of speculation regarding the mismanagement of the, uh, you know, Corona situation. In spite of all this, Netanyahu seems to be ahead of everyone else. So what could be the factors apart from the points which you have mentioned regarding the, the structural party politics and the other uh, you know, issues, what makes Netanyahu as a, as a leader so attractive to the public? So perhaps you know, we can pick these two questions in the beginning and, and I would request others also to uh, you know, write their questions in the chat box. Over to you. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for two very, very relevant, topical, and uh, very difficult questions that are, of course, very, very difficult uh, to answer. But the first question, uh, which raises the issue of the alternative, I, I never like saying that, that there is no alternative to political leadership, uh, largely because um, I come from a, a country that in its political past, um, I was born and raised in Hungary, knew um, lack of political freedoms, where there is really no alternative. Now, Israel is not that. Israel is a vibrant democracy. Likud is a political party that might have centralized structures of authority, but it's a party where elections decide who the chairman will be, elections decide who will be representing the party on the Knesset list at the time of elections. So in other words, there is always an alternative. The question is why Netanyahu has been able, Benjamin Netanyahu has been able to prevail over the alternatives. Now he didn't always. I mentioned that uh, in his first stint as chairman and, um, and, uh, and prime minister, uh, when he conceded electoral defeat in 1999, he had to take a back seat. So the ability to, uh, uh, his ability to communicate, to, uh, and moreover, but not just to communicate, but in a very result-oriented way to turn the vote out for his party is key because votes are really the currency of political parties in, uh, in a democracy. Uh, without votes, you cannot get into power. If you're not in power, you cannot generate policies that your voters, and of course, uh, everyone else in the country, but your voters in particular, those who voted for you, uh, are expecting. So there are alternatives. Uh, but the alternatives have either been defeated by him, and let me come back to this in a moment, or have been sidelined, as I mentioned earlier. So the Likud princes have been sidelined. Uh, they are not there really in uh, leadership uh, positions and uh, challenging positions anymore. Some of the other challengers, he very effectively um, delegated and appointed to take other positions that are going to keep him far away from 
uh, sort of the, uh, the boiling pot uh, of uh, Israeli politics. His second leadership challenger, so the last, so the last leadership challenger was Gideon Saar in late 2019. Before that, uh, four years prior, was um, Danny Danone. Now, Danny Danone uh, didn't do particularly well uh, in the challenge against Netanyahu, but, but he, showed, um, he showed still significant enough following uh, in the Likud uh, leadership uh, primary. So after having prevailed over him, Netanyahu sent him to become uh, Israeli ambassador at the United Nations. That again, that allowed uh, Danny Danone to build up a diplomatic foreign policy experience, connections to the American, with the American Jewish community, but he was far away from the Knesset, far away from Israeli domestic political life. So that, and again, that's a pattern that you often see with, uh, with Netanyahu. Eldar, Gilad Erdan, uh, whom, um, uh, one of the, the, the second, the, the number four image on the liquid list that I showed you, uh, Gilad Erdan, uh, he also, for good reasons, sent to, uh, to America. By many, he was a very able up-and-coming liquid leader that many could see eventually take on and become the next, uh, the next prime minister. Um, there are other uh, interesting alternatives that I didn't mention. The former two-term mayor of Jerusalem, uh, Nir Barkat, uh, he was not in the top row, but also he was at number 10 on the Likud list. Again, many are touting him as a potential leadership contender. Now, Netanyahu has been able to either therefore sideline or defeat within the internal primaries his opponents through a very important uh, strategy. And that is, when it comes to Likud elections, stay in the Likud center. And of course, when it comes to the national election, broaden the agenda a little bit to pick up more votes from the center of the, uh, of the Israeli uh, political spectrum as well. But if Gideon Saar, who challenged Netanyahu, by many, he is more of a right winger than Netanyahu. Right? Netanyahu, actually, if you look at his record, he's very risk averse. Look at annexation. Did it happen? No. Look at sort of the foreign policy excursions. Did he fight any major wars of the, of the kind that we saw uh, under other uh, right-wing prime ministers? No. Yes, there have been, of course, more uh, isolated um, uh, or uh, lower intensity, uh, war, more isolated uh, wars with, uh, with Hamas uh, in Gaza, but of a very different scale and magnitude than, than the Lebanon wars uh, or the wars of the previous decades. So Netanyahu has certainly been a very uh, risk-averse politician, who is going to be compromising on core right-wing agendas if it means political success and survival. Now, if you look at his leadership challengers, Gideon Saar, Danny Danone, before that, Moshe Feiglin, these were all liquid alternatives who were challenging him from farther to the right. So by, again, positioning himself in the center where and when he needs to be, he shows the ability to compromise, which is the same skill that he brings to the game of government and coalition formation that I uh, showed on the previous slide. So I would say, Mudassi, that there are alternatives, but he's been very effect effectively um, using political tools to distance them, to, to defeat them when necessary, and thereafter, uh, when necessary, to distance them away from uh, political, uh, political life. And remember, it's very important what I said. I think it's important to remember that Likud has this very um, leader, it has a political culture that's very respectful and deferential towards authority and leadership. And so long as he brings in the votes, mm. there is no need for an alternative leader to remove him from office. Okay, or to, to, to remove him from leadership. Uh, another, the, the second question was about um, why he continues to be uh, popular. Uh, it's very important to note that, um, first of all, Israel, of course, is a, has a proportional representation system uh, where it's the party that wins a certain number of seats. And of course, Netanyahu win, leads Likud, and it's under his watch that Likud currently shows the popularity numbers that, uh, that he does. It's, I'm not going to say, of course, that those who are demonstrating are going to switch 
uh, and become uh, Bibi uh, Netanyahu or Likud supporters overnight. Not at all. But I do want to say that what matters for Netanyahu and for Likud to stay in power is A, to remain ahead of everyone else, just to have more seats than anyone else, to have that secure, that first shot at forming a government, and thereafter rely on his tremendous skills at coalition formations, which we discussed before, to keep the party in power. Even after the triple elections of 2019 and 2020, uh, he was able to offer enough to blue and white that split that alliance, even though, even though they were at some point even larger than Likud in terms of the electoral following. Now, uh, that's uh, one important point. Two, it's important to remember that while he's in office, he can distribute. He can distribute goods. Like while Netanyahu is prime minister, he is able to make policies and implement policies that affect people's livelihood. That's why it's crucial for him that there is a one-year budget and there's a one-year budget now. So it would be him under his watch as prime minister that the crisis is solved. And when the crisis is solved, when travel restrictions are eased, when the economy starts getting back to its normal course, I venture to say that the demonstrations are also going to take a different course. So um, that's, that's where I would uh, put my money, if you will. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, Mudasir, I think you're muted. Mudasir? Okay, uh, let him join. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Okay, if, if one looks at the Likud and his predecessors, from the late 1930s, Likud only had four leaders, as you mentioned. And you know, is it because of that, in the sense, in the absence of a very strong and charismatic leader, Likud may also go in the labor way, implosion and other things. In other words, does Likud need Netanyahu more than Netanyahu needs Likud? That's a, that's a very smartly phrased question. Um, this is the reason why, Kumar, I wanted to stress the importance of the changes that he made to Likud. Now, Likud, of course, in and of itself, is a relatively new The Likud concept is only born in 1973 as a result of the alliance of various right-wing formations. Prior to that, you had uh, Herut, uh, and then the alliance between Herut and the liberals, Gahal. It's only really in the 70s that the Likud idea is created, then Likud is formed as an genuine organizational fusion of Likud. That, that, that Likud is now not just uh, an alliance, but a movement that really turned into an organizationally unified single party. And that's the party that soon thereafter, uh, Netanyahu actually inherits when Shamir loses the, the 92 election. Now, when Likud is set up, so under its old constitution, um, Likud is, is de democratic, it's decentralized, and there was a very healthy competition, political competition amongst the different factions. Of course, there were challenges to Begin, there were challenges to Shamir, but these were worked out in such a way that the chairman still uh, reigns supreme. And it's important to remember that in the case of Begin, of course, there was a long history of electoral failure and the electoral defeats. So that's an important point to sort of show the DNA, uh, the importance of the genetic predisposition of this movement towards uh, paying respect uh, uh, to the leader. Netanyahu who changed that. So definitely Likud today is much more centralized and in that regard, in that way, also much more personalized, if you will, than, uh, uh, than it was before. 
because the chairman controls and appoints the leadership of the uh, internal election committee, of course, it means that key Netanyahu allies are going to be in the key positions uh, on, on the Knesset list and who will be then making up uh, the party's Knesset, uh, Knesset faction. So that is very important. So in that regard, Netanyahu absolutely needs Likud. Uh, but it's already a Likud that he, he molded to his needs and to his image, if you will. It, it really has become a party that he built, and it was a huge challenge, especially when he becomes uh, prime minister for the, uh, when, when he, be, he comes back to politics uh, after uh, defection, you saw that Likud is in a terrible state. I mean, in 2006, uh, the electoral field, Likud was smaller than Shas in that election. Shas is a small, uh, ultra-Orthodox Sephardic party. So he had to build up the party, and he, he does that. He does that with an iron fist and these organizational changes at, uh, uh, at the helm. Now, at the sa- so, but at the same time, it would be wrong to say that, um, that, ne- that Likud doesn't need uh, Netanyahu. Absolutely so. As I mentioned, um, his tremendous skills as a public speaker, as a communicator, are a phenomenal asset uh, in, uh, in elections. And because, there are, uh, because elections happen often in Israel, in any election season, that is to say there are internal elections in Likud, but also the in, intra and inter-party elections, this is, uh, this is extremely important. In the last election of um, this past electoral period, one of, and this, we saw this so clearly, Netanyahu relied on social media extensively in the first two elections of uh, 2019. But in the last election, he changed track. And much more so than in the previous two elections, Netanyahu was back in the field, making camping stops several times a day. He was back in his element, talking to ordinary voters, not just Likud. And he turned things around. And he turned things around. So there is, he is an electoral asset, so, Netanyahu, uh, so Likud definitely needs him. But uh, it's Likud that's also in many ways his. Mm. Um, and very, very quickly, I don't see uh, Likud going the labor way, um, largely because, the, because of this centralization. You don't see the factional pluralism in Likud today that, um, uh, that you see in, uh, in, in labor. Since Netanyahu has been prime minister for the past 10 years, uh, for, the, for the past 10, 11 years now, Labor has had more chairmen than Likud ever had in its entire history. That's striking. That's, that's a striking difference. True. Uh, thank you. I think that you really beautifully answered that uh, tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we have, uh, we are almost past the time, but can we? Because there were a few questions, so can we extend maybe a yeah, few yeah. minutes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was one question regarding the corruption charges and how that will affect the um, uh, future of the Prime Minister. And then uh, Dr. Rohidas Gupta, she asked about uh, you know, how far uh, Netanyahu's motivation, I mean, he's, she's talking about the motivation of the leader in terms of promoting himself rather than promoting the, the you know, national interest of the of the, of the nation and whether uh, uh, is promotion of greater Israel the main reason for the support which he receives uh, from the right wing. Uh, there was also one question on, uh, on how far the US election in November, the forthcoming election, how that will have an impact on, on the larger domestic politics in Israel and, and the future of uh, the prime minister. Uh, there was also a question bit on uh, on differences between policy differences between Netanyahu and Gantz, and then a question regarding the the future of Israeli opposition. I mean, as you have very 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 uh, you know correctly pointed out, the kind of fragmentation uh, or divisions within the opposition group in Israel, uh, uh, how that is going to kind of you know look for look look like in the future uh, perhaps i think this could be the last set of questions and then we can uh, you know go over to professor kumar swami 
to for the final comments. Sure. Well, we have wonderful questions, but um, <laughs> um, I, I will do my best to not to abuse your patience and the <laughs> audience is patient. And I will try to offer maybe. No, no, we are enjoying your, your presentation. Don't worry. Thought, but, but, but I do have some stronger views maybe on, uh, on some weaker views maybe on others. But let me tell you uh, what I, what my take on some of, on these issues. So the first one is uh, the implication and the, uh, the impact of the corruption charges. So one of the, um, one of the standard uh, claims in the, during the election season, uh, and even now, is how effectively can a prime minister be prime minister when uh, he needs to show up in court several times, uh, several times a week even. So uh, when he has to spend a considerable amount of time defending himself. So this is on the operational question, a very pragmatic complaint uh, and charge. Now, um, a very interesting argument in this regard has been marshaled by one of the opposition parties, Yisrael Beteinu. So this is the uh, opposition party that um, is led by Avigdor Lieberman. This is a, a secular right-wing party, um, largely, but not exclusively, but largely um, picking up the electoral support of uh, uh, Olim immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Certainly in terms of the composition of the party's Knesset faction, you see that uh, being true. Uh, but Orly Levi Abukasis um, um, of Moroccan ancestry also was a previous member of, of this party. So Yisrael Betenu uh, argues that the only reason why uh, the whole issue about the budget and the whole, all these discussions about how to transition from this un national unity government to a right-wing coalition, either through elections or not, is to give Prime Minister Netanyahu the opportunity to pass a new legislation that is going to give him immunity from court proceedings while he's in office. So in Israeli discourse, it's called a French law. Some call it a modified French law, but you see this often being this, uh, discussed. This is the Israel Betinu argument. The budget, all of this is really about making sure that one way or another there is going to be this French law passed so that uh, the prime minister would enjoy immunity from, uh, from, uh, from the charges and from court proceedings. A. B. Um, another uh, part of this argument is, uh, is the prospective fate of uh, what is going to happen to, uh, to the private members bill that former Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked is presenting, I think as we speak in the Knesset, about uh, the so-called override clause, which is uh, uh, a proposal, a legislative proposal that would allow the Knesset to, uh, to pass any law that the court might strike down to repass it uh, with a regular majority. So this would essentially guarantee um, um, a veto to the Knesset over a judicial veto on any legislation it passes. Now, um, the last, according to um, yesterday's uh, information, uh, the coalition, including Likud, was not going to support it. But the day before that, Miki Zohar, the coalition chairman and the Likud, uh, uh, chairman of Likud uh, in, in the Knesset, said he is supportive of this uh, proposition. Now, if the override clause were to pass, that also strengthens, and this is also part of Israel Betenu's argument, that also is going to strengthen the hands of the legislature for the incumbent prime minister vis-a-vis -vis the courts. So, so there are all these calculations in the background that uh, indicate that uh, the trials, like there have been pre-trials, uh, there is now sort of a break. We are not going to see really much more happening until, uh, until the fall. The, the political wheels are turning and there are clearly strategies being played out uh, with the objective of uh, giving some kind of uh, uh, a breathing room or more room for uh, the prime minister to maneuver in order to get away from that very difficult um, uh, coalescence of situations when he would have to go to court while he's serving uh, as prime minister. So again, there is still time to solve this issue. And I think when you consider the override clause, the budget debate, and also sort of the scenarios about how to build a government to, without elections, an alternative right-wing government without new elections, I think you, can, you see that the, the plans are being made and they are at work.
So, um, so um, the jury is still out. Um, uh, we, it may not yet come to this situation that, uh, that Netanyahu obviously wants to get away from. So that's how I see the corruption issue playing out and impacting very immediately, in a very immediate sense, the current Israeli political reality. The motivations. I think Dr. Dasgupta, you asked the question about the good of the country as opposed to uh, the prime minister's personal interest. So here actually that slide that I passed over is, um, uh, can be helpful. Um, and that's about uh, the phenomenal rise of the Israeli um, uh, economy uh, over under Netanyahu's watch. Uh, so if you look at the, the crude GDP per capita indicators, and those the figure didn't come from Israeli sources, not that they are not reliable, but it's, uh, it's verifiable third party source, you will see that under the prime, prime ministers, on, during the Netanyahu decade, the Israeli economy grew more than ever before, certainly in terms of both in terms of its, the, the value of the wealth, the national wealth generated, but also percentage-wise. Where it has lagged is redistribution of that wealth. And you see an important element of that uh, actually being played out in the demonstrations. So that the social unrest is something that, uh, that needs to be addressed with policy. Now, we see that Netanyahu is able to do that, that he, and certainly the proposition of uh, offering these uh, grants to hold people over during the corona crisis, while some say it's a populist measure, uh, some say it's, um, it's a stopgap measure to fix some of the difficulties today, certainly not enough, but it's there to show that the, the, the redistributive streak is not missing from him. But clearly that's an area that has been ignored. Now, mind you, Netanyahu is a right-wing politician. And this is what right-wing governments do, right? They rely on the free market to build on with as little government intervention as possible to bring up national wealth. Well, he is a right-wing leader. That's his economic objective. Well, he's done that well. Clearly, society, the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is growing at a very fast pace. That cannot be ignored for much longer, if it can be ignored. So that's an area of, uh, uh, of criticism, uh, most absolutely. Uh, Dr. Dasgut, I don't know if this question came from you, but I sort of noted it under your questions about the concept of a greater Israel uh, being part of his, no, I mean, yes, there is that concept, but uh, greater Israel is, um, uh, is, if anything, the failure to move on that file, and he really hasn't moved on that at all, is the reason why the, the more um, extreme or the more conservative elements of the right wing are so critical of him. But other than the settler sector, sort of the um, Yesha, so the, uh, the settlers in Judea and Samaria, and Samaria and the political parties associated with them today represented most uh, uh, forcefully uh, by Yamina, by the new right. That was the last picture and the last picture I showed you about Ayelet Shaked and Naftali Bennett, their leaders. They would very much like, of course, the annexation plan to move forward. But Netanyahu has, again, being true to his very risk averse uh, political uh, mentality, not really rocking that boat. So, um, and I am not sure how much appetite there is for that in the senior liquid leadership. So in other words, that constituency, that constituency is really not the backbone, the mainstream of Likud today. It's there and the time may very well come when, if Netanyahu is still in office, uh, when the constellations work out that way that he might act on it. But, but he really hasn't. And again, that's the, one of the criticisms um, that he gets from the right wing that he actually, other than economics, he hasn't really advanced the right wing agenda all that much. He never really passed legislation against the courts, like reigning in the courts vis-a-vis -vis the Knesset, and he hasn't done really much on, uh, uh, on the territorial issue. So, so I, I really don't see that uh, uh, as being uh, accounting for his, uh, uh, for his uh, success. Other than the fact that he 
keeps the issue and the desire alive. And he keeps alive the prospect that if anybody can solve this, it's him. And this brings us to the question about the relationship he has with President Trump. Now, if President Trump were not facing the domestic political challenges that he is facing now, if this were not the threshold of the electoral season in the United States now, would we have seen Prime Minister Netanyahu act on the annexation file? Probably. But as he repeatedly points out, the constellations are not there. And the risk averse politician that he is, he is not going to move until he's domestic and until all ducks are in the row, so to speak, both the domestic duck and the American duck. This is not to say that he is unwilling to um, challenge the American allies. He did. He, he will. I don't want to paint a picture of him as, uh, as, as, as a flexible, uh, almost too flexible politician who only uh, leans whichever direction the wind blows. No. When national security is at survival, and he certainly perceived that to be the case about the Iran threat, the nuclear threat, he did take on the White House. And I don't need to tell this audience about the relationship um, between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama was what it was, what that was like compared to the much cozier relationship between President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu today. Again, uh, he is not uh, afraid to challenge America, but is annexation an issue on which his electoral fortune pivots or not? No. So he can afford to wait. He can afford to wait. So, but I do venture to say that, uh, that if uh, President Trump is back in the White House and Prime Minister Netanyahu is back at the helm of a right-wing coalition, then I would see um, the continuation of, uh, uh, of this agenda uh, played out. Uh, there are credible signs pointing that, and certainly uh, the, um, the Jerusalem decision was, I think, uh, um, one such decision that shows that when the ducks are in the road and these allies actually can and will work together to implement uh, a right-wing agenda. Uh, both on the, on the foreign policy front as well. So I think I was trying to also answer or, or, or sort of uh, sneak in um, my answer to the question about the U.S. elections into this uh, point. And then I think the last question. Uh, there was a question on the policy differences between Netanyahu and Gantz. Yeah, so throughout the electoral period, it was already one of the key weaknesses of Benny Gantz. It was very difficult to pinpoint where exactly he differs, other than the valence issue of offering an alternative leadership. Certainly, Gantz hasn't really come out strongly against annexation. Certainly, certainly when it comes to national security, he, former Ramakta, former chief of staff, he is a very strong defender of Israel's national security interests. These are two politicians who led the country in terms of national defense and government together in the past. So, uh, and while there were altercations, Gantz and Netanyahu worked together. Now, on some other issues, for example, on the issue of, um, of, the, um, uh, of the override clause, blue and white um, is much tougher and doesn't want to pass any legislation that chips away at the power of the court. Mind you, the court is also a great institutional ally for the blue and white opposition, if you will, uh, to Likud. So that makes good political sense. But that's one important institutional slash uh, policy difference. When it comes to the budget, we saw that, uh, that uh, blue and white is, uh, and Benny Gantz is much more uh, determined to have a two-year budget that will, uh, that will, of course, um, give him a budget and pre-commit to a budget for him uh, when he comes in. Uh, as alternate prime minister. But, uh, but other than shorter term tactical questions, perhaps other than paying not just lip service, but genuine, but genuine um, uh, attention to the redistributive, uh, the lack of redistribution that I mentioned, that's an important uh, uh, policy difference that, that I think you would see between the two prime ministers if it were to pass that Benny Gantz comes into, comes into position. And the last question about the future of the Israeli opposition. Um, 
again, because every government is a coalition government, um, it's very difficult to say where the, who is in opposition when. Right? Can we, we can call Naftali Bennett and the Ayala Chakel as part of the opposition today, but you know, just over a year ago, they were very much at the heart of government. I think your Lieberman, in and out. Likud has been in government. So if the question, so that's why I would rephrase the question, uh, if I may, and I forget where the question came from, so I do apologize um, to, to the colleague who raised the question. I would rephrase the question by asking about the future of the other parties, of the non-Likud segments of, of the party. So the last election season showed that short-term ad hoc electoral coalitions uh, can work. They can work in terms of complicating the government formation game. But, but that's not a short-term challenge. And I think that the short-term solution, solution or the short-term answer to this, to the question, to the question of whether there will be a long-term alternative to Likud, depends on one of two scenarios. One is, will there be a party either on the left or on the right or in the center that is going to adopt the liquid strategy of putting forward a, a, an electoral winner leading the party. Yair Lapid seemed like a person of that caliber at one point in time with, organizational, uh, with an organizational setup. Will there be another party in Israel that is going to have chapters, branches uh, throughout the country similar to what Likud has built up, uh, or built up over the years. Now, when you look at uh, Yesh Atid, Yair Lapid, I mean, when I say that Likud is, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is Likud, this is actually a very, uh, it's an incorrect statement when you compare to how Yair Lapid runs Yesh Atid, where he actually appoints, like he makes the Knesset with this. That's really uh, a one-man show. That's not Likud. I mean, Likud you still have very important elements of institutional and institutionalized and organized democracy. System. Will there be a system? Will there be a party that can replicate those two in the... I think that's an important... That, so that's, that, that's key. And the second is whether there will be splintering in Likud. Likud split many times in the past. I just remember Arya Sharon's defection and forming Kadima. Um, this Likud, as it is today, I remember Sharon was actually the leader who defected and brought half of Likud with him. Uh, Netanyahu doesn't need to do that. Uh, and I don't see anybody else rocking the boat because right now everybody wants to be part of the winning team. And right now, Likud is the winning team still winning. on the Israeli uh, spectrum. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I think you have been very generous with your time and you know all the answers with patience you have given. And everybody would agree that we are much more richer today in terms of our understanding of what is going on in Israel. So I think for now uh, it's just for me to uh, request Sir to be to say the you know final concluding remarks. Um, thank you, Mudasa.